professor of biology at UAB and what we're doing here down this marsh in next to Dolphin Island is working on a project with an animal called the diamondback terrapin. This is an animal that's very uncommon now in Alabama primarily due to crab trapping over the last several decades. So what we're doing is assessing their population. We're also catching some of the bigger females and getting the eggs from them so that we can raise them in captivity for a couple years before releasing. And the reason we do that is because there's heavy predation on the nests and the eggs on the beach by raccoons and other animals. So we're hoping that over the next several years we put out enough of these little guys that we've raised and released for a couple years um, that will have some impact on the population. So we hope this will help bring the terrapin back to some higher numbers in our state. This is the start of another adventure in writing my eco-mystery series, The Adventures of the Sizzling Six. I will be exploring the brackish marshlands of the Tensor Mobile Delta in Alabama, the ancestral home of the star of my next eco-mystery, the Diamondback Terrapin Turtle. I'm thrilled to be sharing this journey with 16 very special passengers. The Diamondback Terrapin Turtles who were hatched far away from this place in a lab at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Today, they will be set free for the first time in their natural habitat. Exploring and participating in field trips where I can observe the scientists at work in saving a species is not only a thrill, but also an essential step to the background research I must do in order to write the eco-mystery. Hey, I'm Thane Wibbles. I'm a professor in the Department of Biology at UAB. <clears throat> and we've been studying the diamondback terrapin for about five or six years here. And it used to be a very abundant species in the state of Alabama. In fact, Alabama had the largest terrapin farm in the world that was located basically just about a mile that way, right at Cedar Point Marsh. <clears throat> Excuse me. And at one time, they used to ship up to 12,000 of these terrapin up to the northeast. And if you go back to the late 1800s, terrapin stew was one of the top delicacies in the United States. If you had any sort of social event, you had terrapin stew associated with it. And it even hung in there all the way up to like the Nixon administration where once a year uh, Nixon would have basically have a gala event in which he'd have all the people from Maryland or the, the uh, terrapin fishermen from Maryland bring in terrapin and make stew. And so it has been something that traditionally has been a, a culinary uh, favorite in the United States. Unfortunately, in the 1950s, probably a little bit before, but up from that time period, the crab industry came online. And because the crab industry came online, we started getting hundreds if not thousands of crab traps lining the coast of Alabama. And unfortunately, the terrapin will actually get into the crab traps and drown in the crab traps because they're attracted to the bait. And so the problem with that is, if it were a natural environment, you may have one in 10, maybe one in 100 terrapin of the little hatchlings that makes it to adulthood. And the ones that are making it up to that size, those are the ones going into the crab trap. And so we're losing some of the most important members of the population in the crab traps themselves. And so as the crab industry increased, all right, the population of terrapins decreased to the point where we probably have had a 95% decrease in the terrapin uh, populations in Alabama over the past 100 years. And it's the point now where theoretically it's getting close to where it's going to become a protected, it's already a protected species, but it could even be an endangered species. And so what we're trying to do is bring it back from that endangered status. And one of the two major threats are crab traps and also predators out on the nesting beach. And so a typical thing like out on Cedar Point Nesting Beach, which is the major nesting beach for Alabama, is the, the raccoons will find the eggs every night and basically easily find a nest that's only about four or five inches deep and eat the eggs. So what we do 
is we put these big drift fences out on the beach. So when the females walk up, they hit the fence and they're not ready to nest. They want to find a better place and they walk along the fence and we put basically big buckets and they fall into the buckets. We have a person checking the buckets on a daily basis. We get the turtle, we bring it into captivity and have it lay its eggs there. And so we get the eggs instead of the raccoons. And then what we're doing is basically raising the turtles for one to two years and releasing them where they're at a size that basically the birds can't eat them and hopefully they can stay away from the raccoons. And what we hope in four or five years is to really increase this population. Uh, Taylor basically has been looking at population levels and we think we may have maybe about 80 nesting females on the beach maximum probably 50 to 80 and we're throwing in so far 300 of these head start turtles and we'll probably throw in another 100 this year and so within a five or six year period we're hoping to actually throw out 500 uh, turtles which is doubling the number of turtles out there if they survive and so we're not sure this will work but we're using it also as an experiment as a conservational tool and if it works then we can tell other people ranging all the way up to Maryland that hey we use head starting and we have a nice closed system where we can monitor it and it seems to be working very well and so not only are we saving the population here but we're working with an experiment that will actually potentially enhance uh, terrapin conservation throughout its range in the United States turtles that they somehow quote unquote imprint as a hatchling okay but uh, there have been good studies where you raise turtles in captivity put them back out and they actually reproduce and so yeah oh yeah and we're also well, we do the whole idea if you see all the tags on it is we want to make sure that we so connect we're not doing this live we're doing this yeah. as an experiment most of them okay in hopes that it works but at the same time monitoring to see if it's an effective means of bringing the population back Well, I wish we could remember. <laughs> this is about the fifth year. Five years. Yeah. Yes. Fifth year. We released probably 300, 300 turtles, and we'll release another 50 to 100 yeah, this year. Yeah, and it has. It's it's the uh, it's the what it, when you go and scan uh, your grocery. In fact, Taylor will scan one of these. And like a barcode. Yeah, it's a barcode. That's what I was trying to say. Yes. No, that's the, that's not the, that's the, one the that we have. Tag. The one that we have in the terrapins is a little bit smaller than this. Yeah. And so that's it. Basically, is a little cylinder. Um. My name is Taylor Roberge. I am a graduate student at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and I work with the Diamondback Terrapins on various aspects of their ecology and also looking at parts of their uh, physiology uh, to help kind of bring all of those really scientific things into the world of conservation and hopefully bring back that population. The major things that we've been doing out here uh, for the past probably four years is actually tracking the adult females to see if they're coming from other marshes to nest on Cedar Point Marsh, which is the major nesting beach in the area, or if they're just coming from basically the Cedar Point Marsh area and then moving to that nesting period or the nesting beach uh, to lay on that beach. So what we've actually found, we've probably tracked about, uh, I'd say around 20 turtles in the past couple years. And the majority of them do actually spend most of their time in probably maybe a hundred meter area uh, just off of Cedar Point Marsh nesting beach in the marsh itself. And so that's not only a uh, important area for kind of the juveniles and the hatchlings, but it also seems to be important for those nesting females to hang out and uh, kind of eat their food and uh, grow throughout the rest of the year while they're not nesting. But in addition to that, we actually see these uh, larger migrations where they're moving across the bay into another marsh system where they're then spending the rest of their time in about another 100 meter Kind of circle area where they just hang out there uh, for the seems like the non-nesting period and uh, seem to migrate back during the nesting season to actually lay their eggs on Cedar Point Marsh nesting beach. Uh, Can you tell me more about what role the 
terrapin turtles play in the whole ecological system? So, some of the data suggests that they play what we call a keystone species. And the point is they're, they're very important. If, if you had a normal population, let's say from 100 years ago, there would be thousands of terrapins out there in Cedar Point Marsh. And every day they're eating those little snails. And if they're eating the snails, they're keeping the snails in a good ecological balance. And because of that, there seems to be a diverse amount of sea grasses, or should I say marsh grasses out there, where if you don't keep the snails in check, what they do is they oh, eat the, the marsh there. grasses. And they prefer certain marsh grasses. And so what you end up doing is selectively taking out certain marsh grasses, and all of a sudden you're left with just a few. And an ecosystem is much better if you actually have a good diversity in the marsh grass system and it, it adds to the stability. So they're, again, a very important species if they're up to their normal level. What you get is a very healthy marsh. And, you know, a, a fisherman look, or a person looks at the marsh and they think, what's, what's that marsh good for? But, you know, in addition to terrapins, that marsh is basically a, a breeding ground for fish. It's very important for a lot of the invertebrates. If, you're, if you like to eat uh, uh, crabs or something like that, you'll have a lot of the crab larvae that are in the marsh. If you have a stable marsh system, it acts as kind of a fertile ground for supporting a lot of the seafood in the area. So, um, certain grasses also fulfill a certain role if you get this diversity of grasses that sustains the balance is that what you're saying? Yeah, basically you have a much more stable system depending on, let's say, salinities and uh, weather systems, etc., to where all of a sudden it's a much more stable system, can hang in there and also provide a rich environment for supporting all the other marine life. Thank you.